All right. Thank you. At the end of uh, the era of the Soviet Union, at the time of the collapse in the early 90s, there was the Western desire to reunite Germany east and west. And in, in, the new, in the new time, the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet bloc, dissolved because there was no need for it anymore. And Russian President Gorbachev was promised by the United States, by Secretary of State Jim Baker, that uh, NATO would not expand one inch towards Russia. But that turned out to be a lie. And so today we see NATO on steroids advancing on Russia. It was during Bill Clinton's time in office that he expanded the enlargement, what I call the steroidal enlargement of NATO. And recently we've heard about Ukraine, that Russia attacked Ukraine, that Russia occupied Crimea, seized it, annexed it, stole it. But what you're not told is that in the western part of Ukraine, very uh, reactionary part of Ukraine. A hero, this man in the middle here at the top, Stefan Bandera, sitting in amongst the th three German uniforms, is a Ukrainian nationalist. When Hitler swept through Ukraine, Bandera put on a Nazi uniform, gathered his supporters, and joined the invasion of Russia. Well, just recently, the new Ukraine, the new free Ukraine since the 2014 coup d'etat. Bandera has been made a national hero of Ukraine. And the first thing that was done in the new Ukraine in 2014 was the outlawing of the speaking of Russian in Ukraine. And so today, Bandera and his forces are used by the United States and NATO to go to the eastern side of the country. They're from the western side of Ukraine. And they're sent to the eastern side of Ukraine to attack their fellow citizens, Ukrainian citizens who live along the Russian border, who want to continue to speak Russian. They're culturally Russian. They have family just over the border in Russia. And they're intact. And this is what's called the Donbass region, this, this part along the Russian border. And it's the Bandera forces who are armed and trained by the United States. The United States has set up a military operations base in western Ukraine, where they send in American Special Forces troops from Fort Carson, Colorado, to train these Nazi death squads to go and attack their fellow citizens near the Russian border. This is one of their battalions. You see the EU flag, the blue flag with the star, and then their Nazi flag as well. These are the people that the United States is supporting today. And one of the big supporters of these folks during the coup in 2014 was John McCain. Here seen with one of the Nazi leaders, that's both him next to uh, McCain and also above him, one of the Nazi leaders and the United States politicians, not only Republicans, but Amy Klobuchar from uh, Minnesota running for president now in the Democratic Party. She's also gone, she also went with McCain on one of these trips where they embraced these Nazis in Ukraine. Now, I often like to ask people, why is all of this stuff really happening? Why is all this demonization of Russia, NATO expansion, the Nazis, why is all of this going on? And it, I think the end, the primary answer is climate change. You remember the map of Russia? The world's largest border with the Arctic Sea. And as the Arctic ice melts, 
the oil corporations want to go in and drill, baby, drill. And what recently, it's been in the news in the last couple of weeks, alternative media, that the Rand Corporation has come out with a study calling for the balkanization the breaking up of Russia into smaller countries to make it possible for the Western oil co corporations to go and take control of the Arctic region so they can drill, baby, drill. And in fact, now this, with the NATO expansion and this reality of the Arctic, we see NATO having war games increasingly, US and NATO, up in the region uh, of what they basically call Lapland. Finland, Norway, Sweden, up in that northern range up there, right along the border with Russia. And so these war games are happening over and over and over again. And I ask you this question. What if Russia was holding war games along the Mexican border and in Canada? What would the US say today? What would the US do? in response. Here's another one of the war games, this one in Pola, Poland, rather, Anaconda 16, 2016. They've been holding them every year. Thousands of troops, thousands of uh, amounts of equipment, and the U.S. has now created a new base in Poland they're using as a storage hub where they're deploying weapon systems, they come there on a training exercise, bring these we weapons from the United States, and then leave them there when they leave. And so the slowly but surely, they're creating this massive weapons hub in Poland. What for? It's one of my friends, a great artist from Florida, for many years has done artwork for the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice, where I worked before, and now for the Global Network. This is one of his renderings. What the hell are you doing getting so close to your own border? Because when Russia reacts to these war games by holding military exercises in their own country, in their own country, near their border to say, you're not coming in, we accuse them, the US, the Western corporations, Western media, accuse them of being aggressive. The hotel we stayed in in Moscow, just across the street, was this beautiful, beautiful place. And on our first day there, we walked over there and walked all the way around it trying to figure out what it was. It wasn't until near the end we learned that it was a former palace that had been turned into a hotel. Just a beautiful first thing to see when we arrived in Moscow. This is the Veterans for Peace that Mary Beth showed you, the Russian Veterans for Peace, formed 20-some years ago. Uh, they made connection. You know, Maine was the originator of Veterans for Peace. And they came to America and came to a Veterans for Peace conference and decided they wanted to form a chapter there. They did. And they began coming to America, you know, to the annual conventions of VFP for several years. But then the Yugoslavia War happened during the time of Bill Clinton when Yugoslavia, Belgrade was bombed and Yugoslavia was broken up into smaller countries. And they said that since then they can't get visas to get in the country, into the United States. So they've largely been forgotten about. Most people in VFP now, nationally, don't even know that there's a Russian chapter. And it wasn't until Regis went there a couple years ago to Russia on a trip. And he went up, up to northern Russia where they're headquartered and met them. And as a result, when we were in Moscow, several of their leaders came. And they signed an agreement of cooperation uh, with Maine Veterans for Peace. I carried that along, this agreement, and it was signed uh, between the two chapters. So we hope in the future there's going to be more interaction again. This was a museum that uh, in Moscow, World War II museum. They had these big rooms where... I would say the entire length of this wall were these huge artist renderings of various battle scenes, the most dramatic paintings that I'd ever seen in my life. They're just massive of life during that Nazi uh, occupation and attack of the former Soviet Union. 
And in that same museum, they had this picture. You see up in the right-hand corner, East meets West. An American GI and a Soviet soldier fighting the Nazis together, friends. And we heard this from people that, you know, we were once friends. We but what happened? Why did you just demonize us all of a sudden? Why, you know, what happened to that relationship where we did something together important that should be remembered? And in the same museum, I was very touched by this, inside a big, round, round part of the museum, a big hall, there were some things on the outer walls going around, a big circle, and all that was left it was this big statue in the middle. And that was my experience over and over again in Russia, not a celebration of war, but a remembrance and the feeling of absolute suffering and sadness at what this war was. These people really, really understand war. They say that Sweden, well first let me start with Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan invaded and occupied Russia for some time. And then Sweden invaded Russia 40 some times. And then of course Napoleon invaded Russia. And then of course Nazi Germany, Hitler invaded Russia. And so their whole History is loaded with being invaded by other countries. They know what war is. This is outside the Space Museum in Moscow, a memory of the workers. They always remember the workers who created the space program. And the first astronaut, the dog, Laka, right here, is even memorialized in this. The subways, you've all heard about the unbelievable subways in Moscow. And each one is full of art. And each one is different. This particular one, remembering those who fought and died against the Nazis. No garbage cans anywhere inside of the subway. You can't find them. But no trash anywhere at all. Never. Mary Beth showed you this map. This is uh, Crimea right here. Here's Ukraine. Remember I told you the Nazis live in the western part? That's this part right here. And so today they're being brought over to the Donbass, this side, along the Russian border, to attack people. And they shell schools, hospitals, daycare centers, train stations, airports, all kinds of civilian targets, housing blocks, and more than 10,000 people have been killed in this operation. This is us in uh, Simferopol on May 1st, May Day. And there's going to be a parade remembering the workers. May Day is a celebration of the workers. This is our hotel, the yellow building here. We're out, out front with our flags, and, and we're getting ready to go and join the parade. And we bring this No to NATO banner that we made. Will Griffin designed it, actually. And as we were waiting to start, these women came up, and they wanted to get their picture taken. And there was a whole series of people that followed them, wanted to get their picture taken with us in the banner. And what we later learned was there are 175 ethnic, ethnic groups in Crimea. And at this parade, many, many, many people were dressed in various ethnic costumes to honor those people, those cultures. So it was quite a, an experience. This is us marching in the parade, Veterans for Peace flag. And afterwards, we were taken to a conference in our honor. And on one side were these local leaders who spoke to us. And then on the other side was our delegation. And so they spoke to us, and four of our people spoke to them as well. I remember saying to them that we want to build a bridge of peace. And one of them responded that in order to have a bridge of communication, it has to come from both sides. And we hope that that will be possible. 
we signed a letter of cooperation with the Black Sea Association for International Cooperation in Crimea. They're the group that's in charge of making sure that those 175 ethnic groups are supported and nourished and grow in the community. And so this is the leader of that group. And this is the chair of the Global Network, Dave Webb, from England, our chair. And they're signing this agreement of cooperation with the folks in Crimea. And we want to we wanna take it seriously. We want to find how we're going to continue to work with them over time. This is the Levadia Palace on the Black Sea in Yalta. You might remember in Yalta, after the war was over, Stalin and uh, FDR and Churchill met to discuss the post-World War II era. The United States promised to send money to Russia to help them rebuild after they were so devastated from the war. But instead, uh, the United States reneged on that offer, on that promise, and instead did the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe. But Russia, or the Soviet Union, was left to its own devices without any assistance whatsoever, even though they, they did most of the heavy lifting in the war. And here inside of the Levadia Palace, you see, and even uh, I, I would say they gave FDR the honored place in the middle. And in fact, in our hotel in Yalta, it's on Roosevelt Avenue. And right across the street from our hotel was a bust of FDR. Imagine that we would do that for any uh, Russian leader today. We were also taken to, uh, along the Black Sea again in Crimea, uh, just outside of Yalta, to a place called Artek. You might have heard during the days of the Soviet Union, they had pioneer camps where kids would go in the summertime. Well, Artek was the most famous of all. Beautiful, beautiful place, and it still runs today. Uh, after the uh, coup d'etat in 2014, when uh, the uh, happened in, in Kiev, in Ukraine, uh, the people of uh, Crimea voted to return to Russia, and we were told that this camp, Artek, had fallen in huge disrepair. Ukraine had really just left it to fall apart. And Russia today is rebuilding it, and it's an uh, it's unbelievably beautiful place. But one thing we, we learned about, and they have a bust of a manor inside of the Artek camp, someone that most of you have probably heard about, a young girl by the name of Samantha Smith from Manchester, Maine. In 1982, at 10 years old, she wrote a letter to then Soviet General Secretary Yuri Andropov saying, please don't uh, drop a nuclear bomb on the United States. I want to live. Please don't hurt us. And so he wrote her back, reassuring her that the Soviet Union was not looking to start a war. And he invited her to come to Russia. And so it, the next year in 1983, July, her and her mother spent two weeks in Russia and they went to the Artek camp where she stayed in a dorm with Russian kids her age. She became a spokesperson and over the next couple years she was touring around the world as a spokesperson for the peace movement, calling for good relationships between the United States and the Soviet Union. And then in 1985, her and her father were on their way home to Maine. They were in a small plane that crashed, and she was killed. Her, both her and her father were killed. They had a funeral in Augusta, where a 1,000 Mainers came to honor her. A statue sits out in front of the uh, State Library in Augusta today. And Gorbachev sent a representative and a statement uh, to her funeral. So the people in Russia really remember her. And they remember her as a person that wanted peace. And they honor her there at Artek. Mary Beth talked about this place, the 35th Battalion in Sevastopol, Crimea, where 
we went down, way down, way down under the earth. And they say that as the Nazis came to this place, they closed in on it, uh, Soviet soldiers and sailors retreated here by the number of 40,000. They retreated to this 35th Battalion, came down inside, and the Nazis came and killed 30,000 of them right there at this place. And this, you remember, uh, there was a picture, I think it was Bill that showed the picture of the guide, the woman. And I remember one thing she said that really blew me away. She said, talking about the 30,000 that perished, she said, most of these people were not heroes. They were just human beings. And my mind, you know, is like, in America, every soldier is a hero, right? But that's not what they do there. That's not what they do. This is the operating room. Mary Beth mentioned. And when we came out, we were all crying. And I knew we had to do something. We had to make some kind of statement when we came out of there. Because the media, the Russian media was right here with cameras set up. They wouldn't let them come in and film us inside because it's a sacred place. But they were waiting for us. They wanted to get our reaction to this moving experience. And so we came out and we unfurled that banner. I felt like it was a good thing to do. St. Petersburg, our friend Tanya, that was our guide in Crimea, arranged for a friend of hers, Irina, this woman right here, who brought a picture of her grandfather. She took us and led us through the march on May 9th, the march of the immortal regiment, they call it. I carried a picture of my mother, her sister, and her two brothers, both of which were in the Navy during World War II, both of whom had their ships sunk by Nazis, and somehow, miraculously, they both survived. And so here we were. This was our, a lot of our people right in here from our, our group walking th in this amazing, amazing, amazing experience, 1.2 million people, three-mile walk. Then we got to the Hermitage, the famous museum, art museum in St. Petersburg, and then it was over, and then we walked back to our hotel three miles, and I started counting pieces of garbage that I saw on the street as we walked back three miles after 1.2 million people had just come. And you know how many pieces of garbage I counted? Five. And I want you to imagine 1.2 million people at some kind of march or protest or parade in America. How many? Three miles. Wow. What does that tell you? It, I know it's, it's not a big political thing, but it tells me something about the character of these people that we demonize so much. This is Will Griffin, our friend again in St. Petersburg. He went to this cemetery. It's a mass grave for more than 500,000 bodies that died during the siege of St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad during the war. 900-day siege of the Nazis. Again, a reminder, Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic. You compare it to other Arctic countries, it doesn't compare whatsoever. This, I believe, is why we demonize Russia today. Thank you all.